Sunday when we're going to celebrate communion. Again, it's we do not practice a closed communion. And uh, we want, if you have kids here, we want them to be able to participate in it as well if they're in the sanctuary. But uh, if you want to turn with me to Mark chapter 14, where our scriptures found for today. This will be themed around our communion for today. And uh, I just like the military, so I'm going to tell you a military story. So, in just a couple months, in June, we will be observing the 79th anniversary of uh, the Normandy invasion of World War II. June the 6th, 1944. I don't know how many of you can remember that day. And uh, there's one or two of you that might. There was a thing codenamed Operation Overlord, but it's better remembered as D-Day. 156,000 or so American, British, Canadian forces landed on five beaches along about a a 50-mile stretch of France's coastline to fight the Germans. It was one of the largest uh, amphibious military assaults in history, and it marked the beginning of the end of World War II. And uh, uh, eight months later or excuse me, eight months earlier than that. However, there was another amphibious campaign that took place on the other side of the world, and really you don't know about it unless you're just uh, a World War II nerd. There's just, uh, it, it gets overlooked. It's just one of many skirmishes that don't get talked about. It was called Operation Cartwheel. Operation Cartwheel was a series of land and naval battles, uh, assaults that... Um, would take place in the South Pacific against the Japanese. The initial attack, which was known as the Bougainville uh, campaign, took place in the northern Solomon Islands, and it happened in two phases. The very first phase was the American troops landed and held the perimeter around a place called Torakina. And, uh, and that lasted from November of 1943 to November of 1944. The second phase, which was primarily Australian troops, They don't get a lot of recognition, but they were chin deep in it as well because they were so close to Japan. And Australia sent a bunch of troops that went on the offensive and they just went through the Solomon Islands kind of uh, mopping up any pockets of of the Japanese. The Japanese at that point were starving. They were isolated, but they were still very determined to hold on to these islands. That lasted from November of 44 to August of 45 when the last Japanese soldiers on the island surrendered. Now, the goal was to capture this strategic point, this area, in order to stop the Japanese encroachment that was coming up into Allied territories, and it would give us an operating point closer to Japan to where we could actually have troops on the ground, planes uh, on the field, and we could become a legitimate threat to Japan proper. Now, to make these beach assaults like they did uh, uh, in Operation Cartwheel, as they did on D-Day, you actually had these troop ships known as attack transports, attack transports that were incorporated by the Navy. They were slow, they were heavy, they were weighted down with hundreds of men and a lot of equipment. And uh, uh, some of these would run up on the beach. You've seen the movies where they run up on the beach with the landing crafts. They drop the front and the guys go taking off. That was one of them. The other one was the transports like this particular one, which was called the President Adams. It was a civilian cargo ship that was converted into military use in 1941. Its captain of this particular ship was a guy by the name of Felix Johnson who took command of the ship in, in uh, early 43 and uh, just in time to start moving troops into Guadalcanal and then over into Bougainville. Now, this man's crew, Mr. Johnson's crew, uh, was 65 officers and 600 enlisted men. And of almost 700 people on this one particular ship, there was only one career Navy man, and that was the captain himself. His executive officer was a New York stockbroker. (laughs) 
That just makes you feel real confident. <laughs> the first lieutenant was a Sears and Roebuck salesman. The engineer was a power plant worker from California. And the navigator was an ROTC graduate from Yale. <laughs> World War II, you just got what you got and you worked with it. The following account is narrated by a guy by, by the name of Mr. Larkin Spivey. He uh, wrote a military devotional book called Battlefields of Blessings. This is from the World War II edition. And it says this, it says, In the darkness on November the 1st, 1943, the President Adams entered Empress Augusta Bay on Bougainville with 12 other attack transports and 11 destroyers. Her troops were to go ashore at 7.30 a.m. the next day with the rest of the 3rd Marine Division. Knowing the island was heavily defended, there was a lot of apprehension among the Marines. Captain Johnson described the actions of the Navy chaplain during the night, saying this, I had a wonderful young Baptist chaplain from Texas. Hallelujah. I had a wonderful young Baptist chaplain from Texas on board, a junior lieutenant. Before the men landed, he had something like 1,200 men to give communion to. So he was up the whole night before they debarked. I remembered that he came up on the bridge about 4 o'clock in the morning saying, Captain, would you like to have communion? I can give you four minutes worth. That was the most impressive communion I had ever had. We find in Mark chapter 14, Jesus providing the Passover meal to His disciples and thereby instituting what we call Holy Communion, or the Lord's Supper. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse, verse 22, it says this. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and He blessed it. Then He broke it in pieces and He gave it to the disciples saying, Take it, for this is My body. And then He took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And He said, This is My blood, which confirms the covenant between God and His people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many, and I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This last communion meal that Jesus had with His disciples became known as the Last Supper. The bread and the wine were be taken as symbols of His body and of His blood with the purpose of of being strengthening their union with Jesus Christ. Whenever they came together, they would take these two particular items and do like what we're going to do today. It is meant to be a thing that reminds us of what Jesus Christ did for us. To remind us of the price He paid for us. And to remind us how much closer we're supposed to be with Him every day. And for us, all these years later, we see it as a dedication that everybody might be saved. Because how do you know everybody needs Jesus? Even the people you don't like. The people that you would think, they deserve hell. Can I tell you, nobody deserves hell. We may want to punish some folk, but nobody deserves hell. The difficulty of the Last Supper is just that it's that. It's the last chance. There is no other. It's like going to a prison on death row and they offer them a last meal. What would your last meal be? I remember seeing a commercial for Tombstone Pizza. <laughs> if you don't mind a little morbid sense of humor, that was pretty funny. <laughs> but the difficulty of a Last Supper is there will never be another chance for this. And for all of those countless young Marines that were getting off that boat, to start the Bougainville campaign. To all of those that would jump out of the landing crafts 
on the beaches of Normandy on that night prior the chaplain would come through and would be giving them communion it would be for some of them their last supper consider that for a moment think about that this was the last thing they'd ever have they would fall on a war ravaged beach never to rise again so that a world would be free from tyranny because of their sacrifice I'm proud to be an American I'm prouder to be a Christian because I know what not just the soldiers and the first responders have done for us over the years, but I know what Jesus Christ did for all of us. I want you to consider that for us, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not one of, I'm not just a pastor that likes to preach and scare you into heaven. If it worked, I'd do it. But we never know when our day is going to come. Because how you know our day is going to come? My, my wife and I, uh, as we came back from vacation, we highly recommend do not go to the Dominican Republic. <laughs> they give you Corona. <laughs> It was <laughs> Amen. Amen. That joker peed on me. I think that's what it was. But as as my wife and I, you know, we've had Corona before, and it was this time was a little rougher. But I couldn't help but think we've lost family that have gotten sick, and it's a it's a compounding of things. It's not just being sick with this; it's other issues going on with the body and stuff. But but we've we've lost loved ones that got sick, and you 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 would think, man, it just it's the flu, or it, it's just, but it turned out to be worse than that. The fact that you know, maybe it's just because I'm getting older. You know, we survived. We survived flying in a plane when other planes were going down. We survived driving down the road. And they like they just let anybody drive it clean anymore. It just seems like. <laughs> Do you realize how blessed we are to be alive right now? Amen. Some of you are a walking miracle right. that you should have been dead. Right. We had a man in our church one time and only had about 20% of his heart working. Right. How do you do that? How does the heart even work? It's like you got one pump over here and the other three are going, <laughs> you know? How does... How do you survive on a barely beating heart? I've met some people that I don't think had a heart. They had a thumping gizzard, but they didn't have a heart. We are blessed because we're still alive. And we still have an opportunity to live for the Lord. I think that's why God in His love and His grace hasn't allowed some people to die is because they're not ready to meet eternity yet. The Lord is so compassionate that the Bible says He's not willing for a single one to die and miss heaven. Listen, if you miss heaven, it's not God's fault. It's not the church's fault. It's not some preacher's fault. If you miss heaven, it's because you chose to miss it. You chose something else. And can I tell you, there's nothing on this earth worth missing heaven for. What we have here today, 
and celebrating communion is also something to stop and take consideration of our own life because we don't know when our last day will be. When your time comes, it don't matter what you ate. It don't matter what you're doing. You're just going to die. Can we be honest about this? Nobody gets out of this alive. Something's going to kill all of us. It's probably going to be Walmart. (laughs) I can see it. But the fact is, is there is an eternity ahead of us. And I love the song, (laughs) Crazy People. (laughs) That fits us. Because it's crazy. Why on earth would you even think that there's another life on the other side of this one? Because God said there was. And I don't care about anybody else. I've been lied to a lot in, in this lifetime. Come on, I've been a pastor and a cop. I've been lied to a lot. My God has never lied to me once. And He's the one that says, there is a life yet to come. And we don't know when that day is going to be. It could be driving down the road. It could be lying in your bed. For me, it's probably going to be watching the Dallas Cowboys. And my heart's just going to give out because I can't handle it no more. But but the stay with me here. The question is, is are you ready? You see, because you're experiencing God every day, but one day you're going to experience Him face to face. And the question is, is are we ready? You see, the Last Supper on Bougainville was just that because the chaplain knew Men are going to get off this boat, go charging into Japanese assault positions, and folk are going to die. We want you to be ready to meet your God with a clear conscience, a right heart, and a knowledge of Jesus Christ. As your pastor, I'm here to tell you today, you don't know what today holds. You don't know what tomorrow holds. We have to be ready at all times because Jesus could come for one of us or as the Bible says with the rapture, Jesus could come for all of us. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. I want to be ready. So as we partake of communion today, this is what we're doing. We're preparing ourselves because this world is not your home. You're just passing through. Your treasure should be laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's open door and I just can't feel at home in this world anymore. They need, you need to write that down. That's a good song. You'll make some money off that one. Go ahead and take it. It's more than a song. It's an absolute fact. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There is an eternity that lies before us and God created you with eternity in your heart. You were created with the thoughts that this isn't all. This isn't everything. There's got to be something else. There is. And He is trying desperately to get your attention to focus on that versus this. This will not last. Hallelujah. I'm tired of going on a diet. I'm tired of getting sick. I'm tired of having to get my income taxes written. We got to do that. We got to do that. I'm tired of those things. But can I tell you, those things don't last. But there is a thing that lasts, and it's to be in the presence of the Lord forever and ever and ever. What's eternity going to be like, Brother Mike? I don't know. But it's got to be better than here. Because there is where the Lord is. And I can't wait to see it. Can you imagine looking over there and there's King David. And over there is Mother Mary. Over there some disciples. There's Moses. 
Abraham, Woody, they're all about the same age. I look forward to being in heaven because I get to see some folk I've never seen like my grandfather. I'll see some other folk that I haven't seen in a long time like the rest of my grandparents, hopefully. But I think the worst thing that can happen is get to heaven and not see you there. You don't have to be a member of this church to partake of communion. But the Bible does say to take communion, you need to do it with the right heart. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me right now. I skipped communion one time as a teenager because I knew my life wasn't right. I don't want anybody to have to skip communion today. Because today is a day for making things right with God. The Lord loved you so much that He sent His Son for you. The Son loved you so much He willingly came and died for you. There's not a God here today that's wagging his finger in your face and telling you how bad you are. You do that to yourself. But there's a God here today that loves you. He loves you. He doesn't turn his back on you. He's not ready to kick you to the curb. If you leave, that's your own choice. But he's a God that loves you. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Brother Mike, If I did die today, I don't think I'd make heaven. Then I want to pray with you. Right where you're at. This is a good day. As we're heading into Easter season and recognizing the price that Jesus Christ paid for us, this would be a very good day to make things right with God. And if you're here, every head bowed, every eye closed, Considering your own relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're here today and you'd say, Brother Mike, I, I don't think I'd make it. And I'm ready. I want to know, I want to know that my way to heaven is secure. If you're here today with every head bowed, I want to pray with you. I'm not going to call you out, but I want to pray with you and I want to know who I'm praying for. If that's you, then just slip up your head, look me in the eye and put your head down. I want to pray for you today. Are you here? You say, Brother Mike, I need to know Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Just slip up your head, look me in the eye, and put your head down. Thank you. Hallelujah. The Lord, I pray right now for these that are making decisions for Christ, for you today. That Lord God, I pray, let it be more than just an emotional response. Let it be a very informed decision. That Lord God, they know what they're doing. And they know who they're choosing. And that Father, this will be remembered in their life as the day things changed for them. Come on church, pray this prayer with me. It's not magical, but if you say it and you mean it, it changes everything. Pray with me, Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I give myself to you. Past, present, and future. I am yours. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And lead me into a new life. Change everything around me. Because I'm ready to be with you. And when my time comes, that I can come home. I love you, Lord. And I thank you for what you did for me. 
Father God, I pray right now for these that have asked you into their heart. And Father, I believe across this room, people are just asking for forgiveness and making things right. Lord, I thank you because you are a God that welcomes us. You're a God that loves us. You're slow to punish, but quick to forgive, the Bible says. And I'm grateful for that. And Father, I would pray that today, let everybody in this room sense, feel, and know God is here. And He changes everything. And Father, for those that have accepted You into their life today, Father, I pray that You'd become more real to them as they read the Bible, as they just spend time talking with You, as they come to church. Lord, put people in their path that would help them to draw closer to You and understand You better. And Father, I thank You because I believe today eternity has shifted. And God, we give You glory for it right now. In Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. As we take of communion today,